Okay, Marty. All right, we're trying to give you a little kite inspiration here. We're in the Wright Brothers Gallery, and there's a big connection between kites and gliders and the airplane. So I've got a simple kite, and we're going to build this. I don't know, Beth. I've, I've never been good at building or flying kites. When did all this start with you? When I was in sixth grade, I had an amazing teacher, Mr. McCoy, and one of the lessons that he had us do was to build our own kites. We measured it out, we cut everything, we built it. It looked great. I took it out. It never left the ground. You know, I think what you need is a little more inspiration. That might help. Whether indoor, outdoor, whether three or 103, I truly believe freedom of expression. And I have a saying, Charlie Brown has nothing on me. I have two left feet, but it's okay. We're flying kites. It doesn't always stay in the sky. So it's really nice yeah. to have that uh, ability to crash once in a while and just smile about it. Okay, as you see, even a really talented flyer like Scott has his off days. You know, you're right. I've got the original lesson plan that I had when I was in sixth grade. I'm going to build this thing, and it is going to fly. Okay, well, let's start with the easier kite to begin with, because we only have about 30 minutes. It's a good idea. This, this is, is stem and 30. 30. Now, you see, that was your tail. That's one of your problems. You're losing your pieces. Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty. And we are coming to you live from the National Air and Space Museum. Actually, we're outside of the National Air and Space Museum today. We're on the National Mall, and when you hear the word mall, you might be thinking about like coffee shops or chain stores or food courts, but you'll find none of that here. We have monuments and museums in the United States Capitol. Now, the term mall used to be used just to talk about a park, a place where people could hang out and socialize. In 1902, it was decided that this area would be called the National Mall. Now, the Smithsonian is on the National Mall, and our oldest building is right behind me. It's the castle, the Smithsonian Castle, and it was built in 1855. Behind there, you see the Washington Monument. There are 879 steps to get to the top of it. Now that's a long walk, but they also have a very nice elevator. Now today's show is live, as you can see by all the people walking behind us and all of the natural sounds that you hear of Washington, D.C. But we want you to submit questions right now about kites. The whole show today is dedicated to those. You submit those questions, we have an expert standing by ready to answer those, and some of them we might even use on the show today. We're also going to welcome our in-house audience, the Elliott Hine Middle School. And uh, Marty, uh, the show's about kites, and we know that you've had some problems with kites in the past. Fortunately for you, we have two expert kite flyers. We are joined by Paula Masters and Dave Ashworth, and they'll be flying, and hopefully they'll be able to help you out at some point. I hope so. Let's take a look at what Dave and Paul are doing. Let's start by welcoming Tom Crouch. Now, Tom, you're, you're in charge of early flight history, balloons, kites, and artwork. Right. And we have artwork here today. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Sure, Beth. It's one of the largest artworks in the collection. It's called Delta Solar, 
and it was done by an artist named Alejandro Otero, who was Venezuelan. He gave it to us uh, in honor of the bicentennial of the American Revolution. And I just love it, and other people do too. And a few years ago, we got a letter from a lady who used to take the bus from up on Capitol Hill right around the corner every day. And she wrote a letter to us telling us how much it meant to go by Delta Solar every day. One night, she says, I went by at sunset, a very red sunset. It was pure gold with the movable parts turning slowly and looking like golden cloth. Another time, it was a bright day with a 40 mile an hour wind, and the wings, that's what I always think of them as, were whirling in the wildest of dances. I was born in the year the Wright brothers took their first flight at Kitty Hawk. I, I've lived to see us fly the oceans and fly to the moon, and all of these soaring achievements are personified, if a thing can be personified, in this remarkable sculpture. Thanks for giving me such a living beauty. So oh, that's, a, that's what one person thought of Delta Solar. Oh, I think it's lovely as well. Now, the museum has a long history with kites. And in fact, uh, we used to be involved in the uh, kite festival. Do you want to tell us how that got started? Sure. Uh, if you'd been here on the mall gang in 1967, it was illegal to fly kites. Uh, the police would come and haul you away. And Paul Garber, who was the founder of our museum, the National Air and Space Museum, was a lifelong cart kite builder. He just loved kites. And so he decided that it wasn't fair, that you should be able to fly kites on the mall. So in 1967, Paul organized the first Smithsonian Kite Festival. And this year was the 50th anniversary. The Smithsonian doesn't do it anymore. The National Cherry Blossom Festival sponsors the Kite Festival these days, but it's been going for 50 years and it's, it's a real Washington tradition. And it's still very popular too. It is. They get lots and lots of people down there flying kites. Now, uh, kites are uh, some of the oldest objects in our collection. And you were very gracious in taking us to see some of those kites that are being restored. So let's take a look. We're here in the Conservation Laboratory at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. Budbar Hazi Center. And I'm with Amanda Malcolm, who's one of our paper conservators. And we have in front of us one of the oldest flying objects in the Smithsonian collection. It's a Chinese kite built around the city of Canton, as it was in the 19th century, and sent to the Philadelphia exhibition, uh, the Centennial Exhibition in uh, 1876, as an example of Chinese culture. So it's very important as one of our oldest flying objects in the collection, but also very frail. So Amanda, what do you do uh, to conserve, preserve an object like this? Um, so as you said, these kites are not in great condition. Um, the paper itself is a Chinese, traditional Chinese paper, and it's been wrapped onto a bamboo frame. And the bamboo has been bent, and there are multiple pieces that have been bent and tied together with um, actually a twisted paper and then adhered in place. Wow. Yes. The paper of all of the kites is very brittle. The bamboo is broken and missing on some of the kites. Um, so our main goal, because, because these kites are so important to the collection, we want to stabilize the materials to make sure that they last for a long time. The first step in stabilization is really to understand what your materials are. Know that we're working with bamboo, we're working with a Chinese paper, which is generally a short fibered paper. Um, we're also, we have these really beautiful pigments that very likely have faded, are flaking. There's some white here that you can see is missing, that's from flaking pigment. So although the kites are in really poor condition, um, conservator's job is to make them last for a really long time. So stabilizing the materials and putting them in proper housing in proper environmental conditions. I want people in the future 
to see these prize cultural examples of, of kites. Okay, Tom, uh, do you want to take some questions? Sure. How about we start with an online question? What is the oldest known kite? Well, the word kite, Beth, uh, first appears in Chinese in the 5th century BCE, before our era, a long, long time ago. And since the word is Chinese, that'll, we figure there had to be an object to go with the word. Okay, great. So uh, we think that kites came from China then. We a do. A long time ago. Yep. We have an uh, audience question. Who has my first question? Come on up. Come on up. Ask your question. What year was it invented? What year was the kite invented? Do we know? Well, we don't really know. Again, the word goes back to the 5th century BCE, so they're very old. And we, we have another online question. Uh, have kites ever been used uh, for a form of transportation, like an airplane? Yeah, they have. In the 19th century, there was an Englishman named Pocock who actually built a kite-powered carriage. He got in the carriage and held onto the kite, and it pulled him down the road. Okay. Well, as we know, uh, Marty has been working hard on his kite, and he is going to show us about a kite that he built a long time ago, not as old as the kites are, as we know in history, but a while ago. You Marty. Bet. Thanks, Beth. Now, I've got some friends over here that are building sled kites, and we're going to see them flying those kites here in a little bit. We've got one of our educators from the museum, Doug, helping them. And so they, these guys are doing a great job. And as Beth mentioned, I've had some trouble with kites in the past, so I've got the lesson plan from when I was originally in sixth grade. It's the original lesson plan. It was sent to me by my former sixth grade teacher, and we're going to make that kite. You ready to help me? All right, so what we do is we gather all of the materials. We've got trash bags, tape, um, some dowel rods and some drapery hooks. Pretty simple materials. Drapery hooks are a little bit to find, but you can find those at most stores. So we take those materials and we lay out our trash bag and we're gonna measure out a 21 inch square to start with. So we measure that out and we cut it out. Now when we're done with that, we will end up with a piece that looks something like this. So Jessica, help me hold that down there. So Jessica's helping me here and we've got a 29 inch dowel rod that we're gonna run diagonally across our kite here. And Jessica, if you wanna grab some tape and tape that down for us, that would be great. So we're starting out with that, um, the spine down the middle. We're getting that tape down. And the next thing we have are two 17 inch spars. And so they go on the sides here. So if you wanna tape those down as well, you can. And what we do there is we, we lay those down. Those are basically the wings of the kite. And then we measure 11 inches from the top of the kite down along those spars, and we cut a real small hole. We also reinforce that hole with some tape. You can see I've got some tape here already. So we're gonna reinforce that hole. And then we create our spreader bar. And this bar is basically two drapery hooks taped to the end of it. We take those and we poke those through the holes that we just created, and that we have some tension on there, and that gives us a good solid foundation for our kite like that. The last thing that we do, is we add a, um, a keel to the back of it. The keel is what actually we connect the string to, and then we add a tail to the end of it. And the more tail we have, uh, we add more tail based on how much drag we're gonna need. So the stronger the wind, the longer the tail that we have. So we've got this here, and when we're done with it, it should come out looking something kind of like this. Um, so we'll try to fly this here a little bit in the show, and you can see everything flies really well in this wind. I can't wait to fly this. Now, the National Air and Space Museum has a kite family day where you can come out with your family, build kites, learn all about kites. It's a really great day. My kids love coming out to it. Um, while they were here last year, we talked to a couple of the participants who were actually flying kites inside. Check this out. I got into flying when my dad got his first kite and I was allowed to fly it as well. I like choreographing my kite to fly to music because it's like dancing. I got into kite flying, I went on a fishing vacation. We were in North Carolina and I saw a Wright Brothers replica hang glider. I walked into the kite store to sign up for a flight and there was a flat screen 
with all these kites, with these revolution kites. And there's four or five guys standing shoulder to shoulder doing all these intricate maneuvers. And I went, no, forget hang gliding. I want to do that. You, you just keep learning and learning when you get into kite flying. Okay, Tom, so we saw Thomas Fletcher who's talking a little bit about uh, being in North Carolina and wanting to take a right glider uh, right? flight. Now, kites actually had a lot to do with the development of the airplane. Uh, I have a tough time imagining how you could have invented the airplane if you hadn't had a kite first. Well, let's go over how to control an airplane. I need you guys to stand up for me. Everybody stand up. We're going to do a little exercise. Now, you can keep your kites in your hand. I need you to put your hands out like this. Try not to hit your neighbor. Okay, so we're going to go through the three ways of controlling a plane, an airplane. First, we're going to do pitch. Pitch is this way. Everybody pitch with me. Go ahead. All right. Tom, why is pitch important? Well, pitch is what causes the airplane to nose up and down. Okay. Now we're going to try yaw. Are you ready? It's kind of like y'all without the L. All right. <laughs> Let's all bend it our waist. We're yawing. Yaw, yaw. Tom, why is yaw important? It's what makes the nose go right and left. Okay, now there's one more way to control an airplane. Right. This is the third one. Are you guys ready? We're going to roll. Roll, everybody roll. Now, Tom, this is really important. You guys can sit down. You did a great job. Give yourselves a hand. Uh, so, Tom, roll is, roll is really important. Well, all and control is really important. Uh, when you think about the Wright brothers and the invention of the airplane, really the key to what they did was to develop a way to control the airplane once it was in the air. And roll was the tough uh, axis of motion to control. And what they did was to come up with a way to do it, and then they built this to test it. Now this isn't the real 1899 Wright kite, uh, but it's one just like it that a friend of mine built. Can I have a volunteer? Come on up. Come on up. I'll let you hold it on that end. Now, what you do, yeah, you hold it so it doesn't blow away. There are two sticks right here, and you fly the kite like this, just the way these guys are flying their controllable kite out there. And when you do your thumbs like this, then you move the top wing back and the bottom wing forward and you pitch up. When you move your thumbs the other way, you move the top wing forward and the bottom wing back, and you pitch down. But when you oppose your thumbs like this, when you work the sticks like this, what you do, all right, now hold the top, and we're going to do this. What we're doing, the Wrights called it warping the wings. We're increasing the angle of attack on one side by working the strings and that increases the lift on that side, decreases it on the other side. That means you can balance the kite and that is the way they learn to balance an airplane. Okay, great. Now this kite uh, is, is an experimental kite. It's not very fancy. Um, it's not what? It's not very fancy. No, it's not. It, it's pretty simple kite made of simple materials. Yep. But there are other kites, like the kites that uh, Dave and Paul are flying, that are really colorful and wonderful. And we had a really great experience. We went to uh, master kite maker John Burkhart, uh, his studio, and we took a look at some of his really neat kites. Let's go there. I'm joined by master kite builder John Burkhart. We're here in your studio. Thank you so much for showing us around. A real pleasure. Now, I see some designs of kites here. Can you tell us about what I'm seeing here on the table? I decided to try to do something really different. And, and this is not a design I've seen anybody else do. But I, I was working, first of all, with, with cardboard to, to get angles right and proportions right and and all of that and so I, I, I followed that up with this drawing and and then you notice I've got it on graph paper so it's it's really easy to to measure and and then 
I started thinking about, well, what, what do I really want to build? And what I want to build is a big kite. I want to build a kite that's almost nine feet tall. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going through all the proportions and figuring that out. And I've got the size figured out. Now, you know, if I'm going to cut up nine feet of fabric, I want to see if it flies. So what, what I did was I, I made uh, this, this particular model. Uh, some people call them maquettes. Uh, and took it out and flew it around. And, and that's, that's to test the, uh, the, the kind of structure that, that I have in mind. And what, what I found is that yeah, this is a good start, but, but I want to make some improvements. This, this kite kind of tends to pocket. Uh, be between these crossbars. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to lay real smooth. My test flight generally said that, that I, could, I could do bridling like this from the spine. So your, your original design was okay, but you're actually making improvements on that, almost like a writer revising their work. Yes. That's yes. really interesting. Right. Now, this yeah. isn't the only scale model that you've got. You've got another one back over here, right? Uh, that's right, we do. This, this is a kite. Uh, the graphics are designed by my wife, Karen, and this is called We Become Birds. She made the design and, and I made this to test out the, the colors and, and to test out the shape and the aerodynamics. And now we've made a much bigger one and it, it's won a lot of prizes, uh, but it's too big to put up here in the studio. I was going to say, can we see it? Oh, we can see it. We well, can see that we've moved outside now and we've got the, the model here and the full scale. And John, the colors on this are just amazing. Can you tell me about the colors? Sure. Uh, when you do the colors right in uh, ripstop nylon, it looks just like stained glass. And, and that's what we're trying to do. There are areas here where there are multiple layers of fabric. And of, of course, we've got the stitching that, that uh, gives you a particular effect that, that, that we also want to emphasize. So when you're putting the colors together, you're really thinking about what it's going to look like in the air, aren't you? Absolutely. It, it has to look good when it's hundreds of feet away. Well, you've accomplished that. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you, Marty. I am now joined by Dave Ashworth. You're an incredible kite flyer. We've seen you flying kites and you build your own kites. Yes. These things look amazing. It seems like there's a lot of math and geometry involved in building one of these. There is, in some cases, there is quite a bit. Key, key rules in, in general with kites is you want symmetry on the left and right side. You want, you want the kite sails to be absolutely equal in size and configuration. And you also want weight to be equal. So you don't want to do something that would add weight to one side and not do it on the other side. I think the other thing that's very important is you know the bridle points and the way you configure the bridle so it always has a little up angle to the wind. It's very, very critical. So that angle of attack really makes a difference in how well it flies depending on the wind. Right? That's correct. So sometimes if the wind is stronger, you may want to change what that angle is. So if you can make something adjustable, it's very helpful. Because often, particularly on a smaller kite, it's very critical. And you don't move the, you don't move the point very much. So you have a little bit more leeway for error if, on a larger kite than a smaller kite. Yeah, you do. Yeah, awesome. The smaller kites are harder to set up because everything's more precise. Awesome, well speaking of small, nice, really good looking kites, I've got a friend here, bring, bring this over. She's got this kite that I have built. Um, now I, I, I do wanna recap a little bit. So I've struggled with kites for a long, long time. And so for this show, Beth asked me, why don't you build a kite? So not only did I, I build this kite based on a lesson plan from 1988, but also then I went to um, the conservation area and saw some of the oldest flying objects in our collection with, with Tom Crouch. I went to John Burkhardt's studio, which was just incredible, and saw he builds the kites, and I've been watching you guys fly these kites, and now I get to fly this one on live TV. So um, do you have any hints for me before I get started? Yeah, look, why don't you spool out some thread? And, okay, and that'll make it easier for you. Because if, if the line is only that long, it's real hard to get it up in the air. All right. And you ought to be prepared to, to walk backwards. Okay. Uh, is the wind to your back? I think so, yeah. Good. Try it. 
There, come on. More, more quickly. Come on. <laughs> There's not much wind. Not a lot of wind, and you were telling me earlier that there is a lot of turbulence in this area that there we're is. At. There's because a building right between the trees. A, a large building and, and a big artwork, right. and so it, 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 the wind is not the ideal wind is for sort flying of all, kites, sort as, of as all evidenced by how you know, horribly that one's flying. <laughs> <laughs> so Beth, uh, maybe back to the drawing board on this one. Yeah, it was turbulence. Poor Marty. Yeah, I know. Okay, so uh, let's take an online question. Tom, are you ready? Great. Okay, does the tail on the kite serve any important purpose other than being uh, decorative? Sure. Um, the more wind there is, the more tail you need normally. And what the tail does is to give a little drag to the kite and it keeps it sort of at the right angle and it keeps, helps keep it balanced uh, in the wind. Okay, uh, who has my second audience question? Come on up. Do you have your question ready? Oh, got it. You know it, <laughs> you're ready. What's your question? Uh, who invented kites? Oh, that's a good question. Who invented the kite? Well, we think the Chinese invented kite. As I said, the, the word kite, first time it's ever used is in Chinese, uh, almost uh, 7,000 years ago, a long, long time ago. So kites are very old. They're Asian, we think Chinese. Okay, but they're, they're flown all over the world now. They're flown all over the world for all different kinds of reasons, mostly for fun. Mostly for fun. And there, there are some kite fighters too. That... Oh, there are. In uh, uh, South Asia especially, kite fighting is really a pretty big, pretty big deal. It's a major uh, kind of social contest. Uh, people take their kite strings, dip them in glue, and run them through broken glass so that they can cut the other person's line. And do you win the kite? You win the kite. Okay. We are actually <laughs> out of time. I'm sorry about the second question. Uh, I want to uh, thank our sponsor today, Boeing. I also want to thank Ball State University, who came out and uh, did a great job helping us uh, put this uh, show on. Uh, next month, uh, Marty and I will be looking at helicopters, uh, so check this out. Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM and 30, and check this out. This is a marine helicopter nicknamed the Frog, a Boeing CH-46. This type of helicopter has served in every conflict from Vietnam to today. This particular one served in Vietnam as well as Afghanistan and Iraq. If you think this is cool, be sure to check out STEM in 30. So I want to remind you to join us uh, May 11th uh, for our next STEM in 30. And uh, Tom, let's enjoy Beth, the Beth, kids who are flying. Oh my gosh, Marty's got his kite up. Hey, <laughs> Marty. <laughs> nice.